All right. Miss Patty. Yes. Miss Patty. Oh, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Originally, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I don't like to tell too many people about that because Orlando is such a crazy town with the alligators and the crazy people. What's crazy about Orlando? I mean, it's just, it's the South, you know, and I'm so grateful to be out of the South. You're not even near the coast. Yeah. 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 I, I, what did you say? You're not even near the coast. No, no. You're just embedded in the middle yes. of the humidity. And you know, the, they, they look at addiction and mental health totally different. I didn't get the help I needed till I came out here. How, how is it? How is that? Well, you know, I mean, they have the pill mills out there and I had a doctor who wrote me any pill I wanted and had me doing electroshock down there. And um, it wasn't until I came to California that I really received the help I had that I needed, I mean, you know? And so um, I never want to see Florida again. Hmm. I really Let's go back to your family. T tell me about your parents. I have my, my dad passed away two and a half years ago. Sorry. And um, I have my mom, she's still in Florida. Um, and that's it, that's all the family I have. Well, I actually have an aunt and uncle and cousins in Atlanta. How, how would you describe your childhood? Um, it was pretty good. My cousins really made my life a living hell growing up. Um, they teased me, trying to make me tough because they, I think they, they knew I was gay and they were trying to toughen me up. Um, but I had a pretty good childhood. I didn't start using drugs until I was 18. And then I got booted out of the house because I was gay. And then that's when the party started. <laughs> I went, I ran all the way to my friend's house who was a, uh, she was a, uh, a secretary for a stockbroker by day. And then she ran drugs from Florida to New York. And uh, she introduced me to the drug life and the, and the clubs and everything. And, and, my, and she put me in college. I was probably 19 and she enrolled me in school. And- um, did, she but, pay, did she pay your tuition? She did. And she, 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 she bribed the person giving the GEDs so I would get my GED because I was terrible at math. I am terrible at math. And um, she was a very dear friend of mine. And um, so I did that, but I, I dropped out of school and I, I was a club promoter for clubs in Orlando when I was that age. And I just, that's when it was cute. I was, I was it was cute to be a drug addict. And um, I did, uh, I would do eight balls of Coke with 10 packs of ecstasy on the weekend. And um, there was a time it all worked out. I would do that, go to school, go to my job, do it all over again. You know, that was when I was in my 20s, you know. And then um, I thought, I can't do this anymore. So I ran to, the, to like the backwoods of Florida and I got my, this job as a call center agent. And even that job, like I went in a blackout and I went to, from doing too much Xanax and, and alcohol and I went to this job fair and I woke up and my roommate was like, you got a job and I didn't even remember. And I, she's like, you, it starts at this time. And so I went to the place and I didn't even know what job I got. And so I got in there and I actually did that job for quite a while and then I moved, um, I was like, I have to get out of this small town of Orlando. I got to spread my wings. And then I moved to Atlanta and Atlanta just ate me up and spit me out. That's where the real drug use took over. And um, I almost lost my life in Atlanta. And then I thought, um, well, let me go back to my hometown because I won't, I won't, I will be okay in my hometown. And it just continued. And when I went back, um, I had a moment of clarity 
and my father was in the hospital and my parents were constantly putting me in these mental wards and um, they didn't know what to do with me. And then I, I, a friend of mine, I got a call that someone paid for a rehab for me. Now, I never knew who. And so I went to the rehab and um, I came to California. I went to the rehab and um, that's where I proceeded to have seven years of really great sobriety. Like I really had a wonderful life. But the last year, my my father, I mean, I went, I mean, I've traveled in that seven years, I traveled to New York. I became this drag queen. I um I performed for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Um we raised over $60,000 for gay men's health crisis. I was part of that. I had a talk show. Um it was called Mugs and I have I still have this really great um friendships with everybody. Um, I opened two LGBT sober livings that were cash pay and I helped a lot of people that are doing well now. But my in all that process, and one of them was in the middle of the pandemic and um, my father passed and I think that was the start of my downfall because when my father passed, I went down to Florida I arranged for my father's uh, cremation and then came back. And instead of getting help, I just dove into that LGBT sober living and I worked. I never really got help for it. I did the very Spanish Latino thing to do and just worked. And then I worked, I worked, and then I started doing these classes that my friend introduced me to her and her husband at the time called breathworks and um so i would go every weekend um and and um i thought well i, I need to get out of this sober living i need to get out of this career this this career and i went and got an apartment that i couldn't afford and um so i went to the breathworks and then she was like take this microdose of mushrooms. It'll help you uh, go deeper in the meditation. So I thought, well, Smith, I was like, Will Smith's son does it. Why can't I? And so microdosing turned it into a bag of mushrooms a week. And I still didn't consider myself relapsed. And so for a year, I microdosed. And then... I went to back to my old drug of choice of Adderall. And then at the end of the year, I was just smoking pot, doing Adderall and mushrooms. And the problem with that is it sent me into a very bad psychosis. So um, at the end, I had, um, I went into a bad psychosis where I thought the Illuminati were after me. You know, that you either think the Illuminati are after you or you're seeing shadow people. You know, like, <laughs> either of those two things. And so, um, I checked myself into uh, a psych ward and then my sponsor came and got me and took me back to Arizona, but I was still taking the Adderall and oh my God, I remember sitting in her backyard and um, I, I took her to, and she, she fed me. I was very, I was skinnier than I am now. And she, I sat, her, sat in her backyard and uh, I said, don't call the cops, don't be alarmed. But I am NK Ultra and I've been activated as an agent. And she just went, uh-huh, okay. So I went, I came back <laughs> I was out of my mind. I came back to uh, California. I had my friend uh, Diego meet me at Ve in Vegas because I knew I would never make the plane. I would never make anything. And that's the thing is I have these friends from sobriety that are just supportive so much. Like I needed someone to escort me home because I was so gone, you know. 
and um, he met me. We, he took me back to uh, Los, Los Angeles. And thank God, because I, as, I mean, I was still having such psychosis. I was out of my mind, and I went back in. For, it took them twice to stabilize me. And then when I went in, I was lucky enough to call in a favor. Because, you know, I, I scholarshiped a lot of people in my sober livings, and so I've helped a lot of people. So this place helped me. It was called New Origins, and they scholarshiped me. But it really wasn't a right fit. They were great, but it wasn't a right fit. That's where the one our one friend went that would did this, and um, so I came out here, and um, my friend said, "What bitch? What are you doing in Redlands? What are you gonna do in Redlands? There's no, you know, what are you doing? Come out to L.A." So um, I've just been out here, and I still have remnants of the psychosis every now and then. But I did damage, I really did. Um, I, I still have uh, the in and outs of it. But you know, I, I, I uh, and then 19 days ago, I did this new drug called Kratom and it's, it's uh, synthetic opiates. And so that's why I have 19 days today. And so I'm just out here fighting for my life because I know that if I don't get it together, I'm going to end up on Skid Row or dead. And, you know, I've worked in treatment. I've worked in sober living. I've run gay sober livings. I've worked in treatment. I know that if I do fent fentanyl, it's my death. I just know it. And I know what fentanyl does. So I, and all of this, you hear me saying, I never once did I touch fentanyl. Because I've seen fentanyl, what it's done, working in treatment, I've seen the detox, I've seen the hook it has on people. So in all of this, I've tried to stay clear of fentanyl. That's why I went to the dispensary. I did the mushrooms. I knew where it came from. I never once did a street drug because fentanyl is just killing people, which I never understood. You know, when I was in my 20s and, and 30s, I knew my drug dealer. You know, I personally knew him. He delivered my shit. If it wasn't good, he would deliver it again. And now it's like they're trying to kill their clientele. You would think they'd want their clientele to be alive to buy more, you know what I mean? Has, has, has Adderall been your drug for most of your life? Um, Adderall, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adderall and, and pain pills, yeah. you know, so that's why I've been really careful. The pain pills can get you in trouble. Yeah. Huh? The pain pills can get you in trouble with fentanyl. Yeah. So I've been, tr I did do some pain pills this last run, but not much, but that fentanyl, I, that's why everything, cause it's even being put in the weed now. So I went to the dispensary. And um, I've had so many friends die from overdosing on fentanyl. It's ridiculous. So I've I've tried I've I've stayed clear of it. But coming back to sobriety, coming back to to it's been hard. It's been hard. You know, when I first came in, I had that seven years. I was ready. I, I, we're good. Like, I don't want to use. But this time, it's been so hard. Like I wanted you. What, what made you relapse? <clears throat> it snuck up on me. Is the, the loss of your dad? I think no. That that was a factor, but I had to. It snuck up on me. Somebody was like, "Here's some shrooms," and I went, "Okay," you know, like it just snuck up on me. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to. Um, I go to meetings, you know, and I, 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 uh, and I, and I, and I did things like I helped others to keep my mind off of my addiction. I did that a lot. I started just getting selfish and I, and I just like lost that. You know what I mean? I started working more. I had a pet sitting business and, um, I just lost contact and I, it just, I swear to God, it just snuck up on me, you know, like, 
I had these, I had the end, I had these three pieces of shit in my apartment that were just using drugs and I just didn't want to be alone. But yeah, I, 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 lo I just lost everything. Were you happier during those seven years clean than you were yeah. previously? I was so happy in those seven years. I mean, I traveled. I, you know, I was, I was really, I sat still, you know, I, um, I wasn't so antsy. So, so people listening to this would be like, well, why don't you just continue with that? But I think what happens sometimes is people aren't comfortable being happy. They wanted, I wanted an escape from reality. You know, I, when life becomes too much, I want to escape reality. I want to go down the rabbit hole of not feeling and drugs and alcohol help me do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, right, last night my catalytic converter got stolen and I was like, I want to use really bad right now. You know what I mean? In the moment that, because it, I don't know if I'm going to get that, be able to get that fixed. I have no money right now. You know, it's a new car. It's the only thing I have left over from my sobriety days. And I really wanted to fucking hit a blunt. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, you know, I just don't. And it's those things. It's the small things in life that are like the... the, the which, which are inevitable. Yeah. Huh? Which are inevitable. Yeah. But I want to use when those things hit. You know what I mean? It's not even so much the bigger things. Like my father's death, I handle like a champ. It's those things. Mm -hmm. Like b breaking a, tie, a shoe tie, you know, like, or that. <clears throat> I really wanted to use last night when my car didn't let that happen. You know what I mean? And, 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 and then even like the thought of handling that, like I have to call the car people. I have to... All that, I really, like, I'm like, I don't want to fucking deal with it, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, it's, I, I, ha I have to find myself again, because I used to have a strong sobriety, you know, like, that wouldn't have been even phased me. Today I feel better, you know? So. Looking back at your life, what, what do you wish you had done differently? The person that gave me the mushrooms, she was my, one of my best friends. And we were in sobriety together. And I used to have um, a rule that if you weren't in sobriety, I couldn't, well, if you weren't in sobriety, I wasn't gonna let you too close, you know, for my safety. And she came to me and she said, uh, well, I've gone out, you know, I'm using again. And I didn't listen to my, I was, I didn't listen to myself and I continue being friends. She was a factor in my downfall. If I had to do it differently again, I would have said, well, have a good life, enjoy your using, you know, and protected my sobriety, but I didn't do that. So that's what I would, that's what I would do differently. Hmm. You know, from now on, I can't hang around people that are using or drinking. I gotta really, really get, and then also I have to dive into the trauma and I have to, I wasn't doing that. The trauma of what exactly? You know, like the teasing that my cousins did. Which is horrible know, for a kid. Huh? Which is horrible for a kid. It was, it got, I mean, it got to the point where I couldn't even turn a corner. You know, I remember they, they had me jump off of a roof of a house into a pool. And I still, to this day, remember my side of my face almost hitting the concrete. I remember the side of my face almost like the hearing of it passing the concrete. I mean, they really made my childhood a living hell when I stayed over there. And it was because I was different. You know, because I had this voice and I had, I was feminine, you know what I mean? And there was other things, you know, I had, um, I had other things that I had to work through, but the mushrooms uncovered it. 
I had to say, because I forgot about a lot of stuff. So in, in, I had to say, the, mes- the mushrooms were a blessing and a curse, because a lot of stuff was uncovered with the mushrooms that I forgot about. So maybe, I mean, maybe it's just part of my journey, but I don't, and the, the psychosis that came from it, I would never want to deal with again. Right. How old are you now? I am 40. You're 40? Yeah. So yeah. it ain't cute. <laughs> are you still going to continue with the Miss Patty persona? I think so. Um, when I um, get through this hard time and I have my life straightened, I would like to pursue acting and go to some comedy improv classes. And on the side, I would like to try to see what I, see what it's like to be an actor in this town, like so many. That uh, somebody told me the only time you're gonna feel peace is if you're creating. Miss Elliot said that. I would buy that. Huh? I would. I'd agree with that. Yeah. So we're artists, you know. As soon as you stop, you yeah, you'll find some other distraction, and it's usually a bad one. Yeah. So the happiest time I ever had was when we were working on our talk show, me and my drag sister Anita Diamond, and um, so we, we just had fun. And you know, it's a labor of love. You know about that. You have this, and I just loved it. We we would crack up, you know, and and then when we opened up Catalina's first Pride. It was like a dream come true, you know what I mean? So I, I want to go back to it, yeah, I do. I don't know about drag, but maybe just acting or, or that. Maybe drag, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I just want to find something creative to do, you know? What's your biggest fear now? To relapse. Mm. To relapse and to go into a psychosis that I won't return from. That's that's something to be afraid of. Very, very much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't don't ever want to experience the psychosis. And I, I just don't want to lose myself again. What's your relationship like with your family now? My mom and I have a, de- a, a decent relationship. It's getting better. You know, I try to meet her where she's at. I am surprised by her. She's really come through for me a lot. And, um, you know, I try to move her out here. And, uh, you know, we, we were like water and oil, oil and water. And we're exa- we're very similar, and um, we did not get along. Even in seven years of sobriety, I did not get along with her. I have a, I had a lot of resentment against her, but recently, she really came through for me, and I I really have to say, out of love, out of respect comes love, because I really, I've always respected her. For, for a month, for her her mother's skills and um, as a woman, but um, she I mean, really respect and love are much more closely related than than love and sex or love and other yeah. things. Yeah, respect is is huge. Yeah, and having somebody that's really on your side, no matter what, how bad, no matter how bad you screw up, who still has your side is by your My back. dad was like that. My dad, no matter if I was right or wrong, my dad was like on my side. And my mom was always on his side. My mom was a Spanish loyal wife with a purse on the, on the, on the lap, you know. They were married 43 years, my mom and dad. And um, I'm lucky to come from a marriage of love. Not a marriage of like they're just holding on. My parents were in love. And so... Um, but I, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm very surprised at my mother's loyalty to me, you know? Do you have siblings? I have step-siblings. I have um, a sister in Chile and a sister in Stockholm, Sweden. Who are from your dad or your... 
pre previous marriages of my mother. Of your mother. Mm -hmm. Do you have friends now? I do. It helps. Yeah. I ha a lot of the boys that went through my LGBT sober living are my friends, and they're doing well now. I remember one one friend, of, uh, his name was Fernando. I just saw him, um, and um, he could not stay sober to save his life, and now he's getting a year, and I would always let him return and um, to the sober living. I would catch so much flack for it. And it's a trip he's getting a year, and I, it's a trip that he's getting a year, and I only have 19 days. But he was so happy to see me. Um, and a lot of people are doing well. A lot of people are doing, and they're just, you know what, when I see them, you, I would think, um, I saw another friend of mine, I saw two, one friend of mine, and, another, and I, I expect, I guess, like, I don't know what to expect when I tell them I have 19 days, but they're happy I'm alive. They're just happy I'm alive. Even people that I had problems with or were catty in the past, they're happy I'm alive. I think so many people have lost people. Yeah. Because of fentanyl. But... Because of fucking fentanyl. You know what I mean? Um, and um, I have one friend that I'm meeting Saturday, I believe it is, and um, we both were going through our addiction at the same time, and we both are going to rehab. He's in rehab, and um, man, we just went through it, you know. And we're again just happy each other are alive, and it, it's like it's like a trauma bond almost, you know. Like we we've survived drugs, you know what I mean? So yeah. Miss Patty, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Do the work, even if it's uncomfortable. Stay present and in the moment. And find ways to be content with what you have. You know? and stay grateful and humble because that was the thing when I, I had the apartment in Newport, I had my own pet sitting business, you know, and it was never enough, you know, and that ate me alive, you know? So I pray to be content on a daily basis, just to be content, you know? So that that's, that's what I pray for. Finding a creative project that you can be passionate about is, yes. the key to, is the key to that. Yes, to find a creative project that I can pour my soul into. I would love that, yeah. Excellent. All right, Miss Patty, thank you so much for coming in, sharing your story. Yes. I wish you lots of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much.